This is a live webinar, and uh, I'm Tom Altier. I'm the media correspondent for the Environmental Health Symposium. And we have brought in one of our sponsored speakers from the Environmental Health Symposium this April in Scottsdale, Arizona. And this is Dr. Bob Miller. He is a conventionally trained naturopathic physician. And he's also the founder and president of Nutrigenetic Research Institute and Functional Genomic Analysis. And Bob, if you haven't heard him lecture, will blow your mind. He goes around in circles and tells you why you should be looking at genes. Yes, you have to look at diet. Yes, you have to look at lifestyle. And when you've tried therapies and you're like really stuck and you're not sure why, you start diving into some Bob's analysis here from the functional genomic analysis and you'll see answers popping out. And Bob's gonna put those pieces together for us tonight. He's gonna talk about one specific aspect of genomics that we should really be looking at, which is NADPH deficiency. So Bob, take it away, my friend. Okay, well, thank you so much. Pleasure to, uh, to be here. And uh, thank you for those, uh, for those kind words. And I'm hoping over the next hour that uh, you're gonna learn why in many of the, uh, the patients or clients that you are seeing, uh, why you were stuck sometimes. And, and this come, came to me after years, of, uh, years and years of research. So here's a, a cute little slide that I actually had drawn uh, just for some of my conferences, because I call this the 3D chess game that's played underwater. Uh, you know, many people are looking for the gene that might be the answer. And I think they're gonna be continually frustrated because of that, because I don't think there is one because it's this spider web of inner reactions. So here's what can happen. Inner, inherited genetics can cause more free radicals. And we'll be talking about some of those in our future webinars. Inherited genetics may cause less than optimal antioxidant production. And then you can have some genomics that causes less than optimal digestion. Now, one of the areas that we've really placed our focus on in the past year is looking at the genomics for phase one, phase two, and phase three detoxification, and also uh, autophagy and the urea cycle. Now, genetics is maybe a third of the piece because you've got your epigenetic factors, your processed foods, stress, EMF, pesticides, plastics, you all know these things, uh, mold, mycotoxins, growth hormones given to the animals, xenoestrogens from our plastics and heavy metals. All of these factors impede your ability to detox from all these environmental toxins. Now, what we'd like to learn tonight is how environmental toxins often lead to excess inflammation, and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir on this. We're gonna talk about how inflammation is a major cause of uh, many of the illnesses and premature aging and our ability to detox properly. But the main thrux of what we're going to be talking about is NAD plus and NADPH. Because these are critical molecules that support the recycling of your antioxidants. Interestingly, DNA repair through what's called the PARP enzymes and very critical processes of function and detoxification. Now, we're just not going to give you some theory, but we're going to give you some ideas as to how you can determine where there's potential weakness in the NAD plus and the NADPH production and utilization. We're gonna be briefly talking about the NADPH steel and the NOx enzyme, but that is the major subject of our next webinar. And then of course, uh, what to do, your action steps. So I'm gonna go through these couple of slides very quickly because you folks all know this, your PAHs, your mycotoxins. And I was just talking to Mike uh, prior to, uh, as we were getting set here, that I'm becoming convinced that uh, mycotoxins is a much more serious issue than any of us uh, ever realized. Uh, your dioxins, your amylenes, your herbicides, pesticides, and insecticides, and your food contaminants and artificial sweeteners. And of course, you all know this, your, your xenobiotics uh, are fat soluble, then phase one, uh, turns them into that fat soluble that has to be cleared by phase two. Then phase two has water soluble waste that has to be eliminated in phase three through the bile, urine, and feces. And I'm gonna be talking about how NADPH is a key player in a lot of these uh, 
processes. So, as you all know, environmental toxins stimulate chronic inflammation through a variety of mechanisms, including the depletion of critical cofactors. And let me just talk a little bit about cofactors. You know, a lot of people look at the genomics and they say, oh, well, I've got COMT or I have HNMT. That might be relevant and that could account for some of the function. But if you don't have the cofactors, uh, that is just as important. Let me just park on the HNMT for just a little bit, histamine and methyl transferase. That is the gene that takes your excess histamine, attaches a methyl group to it, SAMI, and then degrades the histamine. Now, clearly, if you have genetic mutations in HNMT, you may have some difficulty uh, clearing histamine. However, if you have perfect HNMT, and something's happening that you don't have enough methyl groups through SAMI production, you're not going to clear histamine, no matter what your genomics are, no matter how good your enzyme is. And then additionally, something called hydroxyl radicals will impede the production of that SAMI. So you could have genetic factors that could make less methylation, but you could have epigenetic factors, for example, through the improper use of iron. That'll be our third webinar that blocks the methionine to SAMI conversion. So multiple factors going together. Now, as you, most of you know, endocrine disrupting environmental toxins have been reported to alter the Th1, Th2 balance and stimulate dramatic changes in cytokine production, including the IgE, ultimately contributing to inflammation. And of course, your gut microbiome is also subject to the uh, volatile properties of environmental toxins. Now, again, I know you all know this, but just a quick review. Uh, inflammation can be triggered by pathogens, cellular injury, apoptosis, oxidative stress, environmental toxins that we discussed, stress and excitement, and genetic predisposition. Now, we tend to you know, compartmentalize and say antioxidants are good, free radicals are bad. But however, we do need low levels of inflammation for immunity, uh, remodeling, development, and learning. However, it's that high level chronic inflammation that leads to the excess oxidative stress, aging, and a host of chronic concerns, increase, including increased uh, blood-brain barrier permeability, neural damage, neural degeneration, and actually may increase sensitivity to stress. So you'll see on the chart here, here's inflammatory mediators creating the inflammation and oxidative stress, and that creates the mitochondrial dysfunction, DNA damage. Now, again, I'm going to go through these couple of slides very quickly because I'm sure you all know this. But just to review, inflammation and particularly uh, white blood cells, including mast cells, have been implicated in uh, various pathologies of the cardiovascular system. So it is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Uh, inflammation and diabetes, inflammation of the pancreas, a major contributing factor to uh, both type 1 and type Two, osteoporosis. It's not just calcium deficiency. There's an association between systemic inflammation and systemic osteoporosis and co-localized inflammation and osteoporosis. Uh, several analyses have found the inflammatory potential of participants' diets have been associated with bone mineral density and risk of fractures. Inflammation and cancer, no doubt there's a connection here, uh, contrib may contribute to the development and uh, the pathogenesis of cancer. It has been hypothesized that up to 25% of cancers associated with chronic inflammation due to an infection or physiochemical agents. Mental health. Um, I'm gonna be speaking this uh, August at IMMH where the talk is gonna be on neuroinflammation. And by the way, if you get a copy of these slides, you see we have all the, uh, the papers associated with this, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, TBI, spinal cord interest, injury, depression, anxiety, ADHD, and autism. So targeting neuroinflammation has been reported on several accounts to be a potential viable option for supporting healthy neurological function. Uh, clearly, turn on the news for 10 minutes. Talk to an elementary school teacher who's been teaching for more than five years. Talk to a college professor. Ask them about the children today and the young adults today versus 
five, 10 years ago, clearly on the rise. Here's quite fascinating, imbalance of the kyrenine pathway due to stress and inflammation can increase the production of neurotoxic intermediates such as quinolinic acid. And I'll be showing you a chart with quinolinic acid uh, a little bit later on in the webinar that may contribute uh, to the anxiety. That's why I'm a, a big fan of looking at the QPRT enzyme. And uh, invariably, when people don't turn that quinolinic acid down the pathway, they many times have anxiety. Uh, inflammation has been reported to potentially contribute to anxiety through the induction of cytokines and oxidative stress. And clearly, more and more evidence is showing that uh, neuroinflammation is playing a role in uh, autism. Uh, altered levels of cytokines have been found in individuals <clears throat> with autism and may be related to neuroinflammation. Now, this is what we're going to be talking about tonight. So I'm going to slow it down and make sure that you get all this information. The subject is NAD+, NADH, NADP+, and NADPH. And I became very fascinated with these uh, maybe about two years ago now. We're continuing to study them. And I honestly believe as we look at how genetic factors can influence the production of this or decrease it, and then more importantly, how epigenetic factors can chew it up. Uh, I believe this is a very underlooked piece of why we're having such difficulty today with detoxification in general, but many of the chronic illnesses uh, that we're seeing. Now, NAD plus is an activated carrier involved in redox reactions and transferring electrons. And as you all know, we are, uh, you know, we are electrical beings. Now, there's two forms of it, NAD+, which is an oxidizing agent. It means it accepts electrons from other molecules, and then it becomes reduced. And this is what forms NADH. Now, of course, you know, most of you remember back when you studied the Krebs cycle, uh, NADH is at the very top of the electron transport. So NADH is necessary for the uh, production of ATP, by the, uh, by the electron transport system. Now, because of the importance of these functions, the enzymes involved in NAD metabolism have a critical role in maintaining homeostasis. And the more we're doing research, the more we're seeing that environmental and epigenetic factors is altering this substantially. And we're gonna talk about NADPH in a moment, and that is what donates electrons and we'll show you a chart how this is involved in recycling your antioxidants. It's synthesized from NAD plus and has similar functions as an activated carrier. Now, look at all the things that uh, NADH, uh, NADPH is involved with. Energy metabolism, mitochondrial function, calcium homeostasis. This is a key piece right here. It's involved with antioxidants but look at this, generation of oxidative stress. And this is what intrigues me the most. NADPH is critical for your antioxidants, but it's also used to make oxidative stress. That's what we'll be talking about tonight. It's involved with gene expression, immunological functions, aging, and even cell death. Now, this is a chart that I made that shows why NADPH is so important. Uh, I'm sure you all know the importance of nitric oxide. We'll be looking at the one at the, the bottom left here. Nitric oxide, you know, won the Nobel Prize in the 1980s. We think of nitric oxide as your, uh, as your molecule that helps dilate the blood vessels, so it's needed for good blood flow, erectile function. But we're learning that nitric oxide goes well beyond that. As we'll show you a little bit later, nitric oxide is even involved in calming down mast cells. It's involved in helping the body make uh, NADPH. But nitric oxide is NADPH dependent. If we don't have enough NADPH, we're not going to make our nitric oxide. Now, I don't have this slide here, but if any of you have heard my lectures before, you know we talk about NOS uncoupling, where BH4 is supposed to combine with L-arginine 
and NADPH by the NOS enzyme to make nitric oxide. But if it doesn't, it makes superoxide. Then that combines with the nitric oxide you have left over and makes the very powerful oxidizing agent peroxynitrite. nitrite. So if we don't have enough NADPH, your nitric oxide production can be impaired. Uh, thriodoxin, not talked about very much. This is your TRX OX here. Uh, and I'll show a slide later that thriodoxin is involved with clearing hydrogen peroxide. Uh, I just did a consult with a, uh, a functional medicine doctor who had someone who he was stuck with. The poor woman, nothing seemed to be working. Glutathione made her worse. And we found that she had severe difficulty with her thriodoxin reductase enzyme that takes the oxidized uh, thriodoxin back to the reduced. However, NADPH dependent. Now, we all know glutathione, master antioxidant. We need NADPH to take this uh, oxidized glutathione back to reduced. Here, the GSH is your glutathione. Your GSSG is your oxidized glutathione. You need NADPH to take it back. If you don't, you stay stuck in your oxidized, and I'll show you a slide on that in a moment. Now, if you look at the bottom right, because I'm not sure if you're seeing my, uh, my cursor or not, we need NADPH and cytochrome P450 reductase to turn your used heme into ferritin. So unfortunately, many people are low in ferritin and well-meaning practitioners say, oh, let's just give you a little bit more iron. Clearly, there are times that iron is needed. But if the problem is your heme is not turning into ferritin, the iron from the heme can just get dumped and create free radical damage and by taking iron, we're making the situation worse. Heme also turns into biliverdin, another very powerful antioxidant. And this is one that many people don't know. Heme actually turns into carbon dioxide, which we tend to think of as bad, but carbon dioxide stimulates NERF2 and KEEP1 and also stimulates the DNA repair enzymes. So carbon dioxide isn't uh, all bad. Now, this is one of my favorite uh, slides that I like to show to individuals. Here is your uh, reduced glutathione. And of course, that's made from cysteine, uh, glycine, and glutamate. And by the way, genetically, if you have difficulty with these enzymes, this process may not work very well. But here's your reduced glutathione. The GLRX enzyme takes your reduced glutathione and uses it. And here's an example of phase two glutathione conjugation, which is necessary to take out a lot of toxins, including mold and mycotoxins, which is becoming a huge issue. So after glutathione does its job, it becomes oxidized glutathione. Now here's what's uh, very fascinating. We need NADPH and the GSR enzyme to take that oxidized glutathione back to your reduced. So if we don't have enough NADPH or the GSR enzyme is not functioning properly, which you can see by looking at genomics, uh, and I don't have it on here, but NERF2 controls all of these. NERF2 controls GCLM, GSS, GLRX, GSR. So if you even have NERF2 weakness, these can be compromised. So there's a lot that can go wrong here. If you don't have enough NADPH, you don't have enough GSR, NERF2 is not controlling it, you can get stuck down here in oxidized glutathione. Now I'm sure many of you listening to this have thought you see someone with inflammation, and of course, what's your first reaction? Give them some glutathione. Well, if your glutathione is used properly, it's recycled properly, it's a good thing. But look what happens. If you get stuck down here in oxidized glutathione, that oxidized glutathione will combine with oxygen to make superoxide, nitric oxide to make peroxynitrite. Uh-oh. Now, I don't have it on here, but interestingly, oxidized glutathione will also impede the salt enzyme, S-U-L-T, which is your sulfation. And if any of you have ever listened to Stephanie Seneff, uh, you know how she makes a very good argument 
that our sulfation is being impaired by glyphosate by impacting the heme cycle. But additionally, if you don't have your oxidized glutathione being turned back into reduced, uh, you're going to be in trouble. You are not going to be able to uh, neutralize the free radicals. You're, if you take more glutathione, you can actually make a bad situation worse, which is mind-boggling. But And you can also impede sulfation. So there you can see the NADPH, a critical piece of your glutathione. Now, the next thing we're going to look at, this is what we're going to be talking about in depth in our third webinar, the Fenton reaction. Just wanted to give you a little teaser here. In the mitochondria, when we make energy, an electron can fly off combined with oxygen to be superoxide. The enzyme superoxide dismutase turns it into hydrogen peroxide. Then we need catalase, glutathione peroxidase driven by glutathione, and that thriodoxin to clear this into water. If we don't have this working properly, iron will combine to make hydroxyl radicals, OH minus, nasty son of a guns, damages the proteins, carbohydrates, and DNA. This is why there's ever increasing interest in hydrogen water because the hydrogen water takes this OH minus, turns it into H2. So you can see here, your fats will get oxidized, your hydroxyl radicals will combine with nitric oxide to make peroxynitrite, and then uh, peroxynitrous acid, which is another oxidizing agent. So this whole thing can go awry. So one of the things we find that we'll talk about in webinar number three is that many individuals have genetic predispositions to overabsorb iron, particularly the English, Irish, the Ashkenazi Jewish. We'll talk to you about the SLC40A1s, the ferroportins, and myriads of other things that can make this iron uh, go off on its own. And iron is absolutely necessary, but excess or unregulated iron can do tremendous damage. So what do we need? NADPH to recycle your glutathione, your thriodoxin. If you don't have enough here, you don't clear your hydrogen peroxide, boom, you've got damage to the proteins, carbohydrates, and the DNA. Now, many years ago, you know, 12, 13 years ago, we started talking about MTHFR. Clearly an important enzyme. Puts the methyl group on your, uh, on your methylfolate for methylation. However, I firmly believe that we've gotten a little carried away. People do their genetics like with 23andMe or Ancestry, they run it through it online or some other program and they see they have MTHFR and it's like, oh my God, I need methylfolate. And either they're their doctor or they do it on their own, they get methylfolate. Here's a little known fact. If we don't have enough NADPH, which then will affect your you know, oxidized to your reduced glutathione ratios, taking methylfolate will shift the redox balance towards oxidation. So that's why some people take their, uh, their methylfolate and uh, they're all excited thinking they're gonna feel better and they often do for a short period of time, then they start getting more anxious or inflamed. So that's why that makes me doubly concerned that we have to make sure we have enough NADPH before we start giving a lot of uh, methylfolate. Now, what I'd like to show you here is the, uh, is the chart of how NADPH is synthesized. We start over here with tryptophan, and of course you all know that turned into serotonin. Your TDO, TDO, IDO1, IDO2 begins the process down through here, resveratrol is needed. KYNU enzyme comes down through, then we make this Quinolinic acid. For any of you who do the, uh, the Great Plains urine organic, you know that they do show measures for quinolinic acid. This induces NMDA receptor mediated lipid peroxidation and is neurotoxic if QPRT is not doing its job adequately. Interestingly, grapeseed extract will help. Now, as you know, there's been a big push towards taking a niacin, nicotamide riboside, nicotamide mononucleotide. Here's where they come in, and then they go down through the path here to make your NAD+. Now, this is very important here. 
you'll see your NAD plus is right here. IDH3 takes it up to NADH. NQO1 brings it back down to NAD plus. What we've been observing is that many people that are struggling, migraines, tremors, uh, many of the ADDs, they've got genetic mutations in NQO1. And consequently, they get stuck in NADH. Now, again, we need this for the electron transport. But if this ratio is off, it can create an excitatory situation. Interestingly, Paul Diarco supports that NQO1. If we have time at the end, I'll give a case study of how we help the man tremendously with tremors by just Paul Diarco. Now, NAD plus also comes down through NAD kinase and IDH2 to make your NADPH. And the reason this is so important, NAD plus is also needed for your PARP enzymes responsible for DNA repair. Now, here's a chart that shows the relationship between them. Here's your NADH becoming NADPH. And you can see this goes both ways, NAD plus and NADH, NAD plus to NADP plus. So there's many ways that these can get uh, turned back and forth between each other. I'm going to be focusing tonight on how NADPH needs it for antioxidant recycling and nitric oxide production, and how NAD plus supports the sirtuins and the FOXO, which then are responsible for your very critical SODN catalase. So NAD plus levels decline uh, in cellular tissue organ and entire organism throughout aging, affecting the activity of these NAD consuming enzymes. And that may be associated with broad a range of associated pathologies. It's been hypothesized to be primarily the result of decreased expression of the NAMT enzyme, which converts nicotamide to uh, NMN. That's why I'm a big fan of supplementing with a little bit of NMN. And through functional genomic uh, nutrition, we've actually formulated some products with this and Podiarco. It has been hypothesized that age-associated inflammation may decrease the NAMPT expression and consequently the NAD plus production. Now we're going to talk briefly about the, uh, the sirtuins. And this is one of the maps that we have in, uh, in our, uh, in our displays for folks. And just a side note, in the next couple of months, these maps are going to be showing up in the genomic software. And each of these enzymes will be lighting up a color based upon the amount of SNPs. Because again, it's the 3D chess game. So you saw the NAD plus, here's PARP, but this also supports CERT3, which interestingly supports the urea cycle, FOXO, which is responsible for your catalase and SOD. CERT1 is responsible for proper use of vitamin D. So if you've ever seen someone that can't get their vitamin D up, no matter how much they supplement, lack of NAD plus or mutations in CERT1 could be a problem. But this is what I find very exciting. mTOR, the growth of new cells, autophagy, the cleaning of cells. And as you know, there's a big push on autophagy. That's why we do the ketogenic diet, the intermittent fasting. Another webinar someday might be why I believe epigenetic factors are upregulating mTOR that weakens autophagy. But CERT1 inhibits mTOR, CERT3 supports autophagy. And when we don't have enough autophagy, that's when we don't make the autophagosomes that clears out the pathogens. That's why we get the age spots, sunspots, liver spots. I don't know about you folks, but I'm seeing people in their late 40s, early 50s starting to get age spots all over their hands, face, and chest because mTOR is being upregulated. And as you know, mTOR doesn't cause cancer, but it feeds cellular growth, and it will feed cancer cells as well as any other cell uh, if we have some inside the body. Now, sirtuins are NAD plus dependent deacetylase enzymes, and they have a significant role in regulating aging and longevity. And we could do a whole webinar on uh, sirtuins, but basically they're histone deacetylase enzymes that use NAD to remove the acetyl groups from the histones, which enables the uh, reduction in the genetic expression. As you know, the DNA gets coiled and the 
uh, deacetylation is what uh, uncoils it. So here is a uh, an example of how sirtuin activity has been uh, hypothesized to have a potential role in in aging. So you can see here that when acetylation and deacetylation are uh, balanced, everything's doing well. It's hypothesized in a cancer cell, this gets uh, out of balance. So rather than being optimum, they're both off. Now, this is what uh, the CERT-1 looks like in the functional genomic software. Has a significant role in development. It's a marker of cell sentences, or cell sentences senescence, and it decreases during aging, likely due to low NAD+. Decreased levels are found in the aging liver. It plays a critical role in the expression of MOA, MAOA, which again, that's one of your histamine clears. AMPK, that's one of your uh, primary pushers of autophagy. Regulation of FOXO, which uh, pushes SOD, inhibits IGF-1 and mTOR. Resveratrol, courses in caloric restriction may activate the CERT-1 activity. So that's why intermittent fasting is becoming so popular. Uh, CERT-2 and 2 found in the cytoplasm. Uh, FOXO-1 and FOXO-3 that we're going to talk about is regulated by that. And again, this is a critical role in inducing autophagy. One of my uh, Lyme studies that, uh, that I presented in Boston a couple of years ago illustrated that genetically, those with chronic Lyme had more of a predisposition to upregulated mTOR and downregulated uh, autophagy. I really keep my eye on CERT-3 because this regulates metabolic processes, participates in DNA repair, neuroprotection, tumor suppression, autophagy signaling, and SOD2, one of your uh, your major SODs, is uh, mediated by CERT-3. Now, what's interesting is the reactive oxygen species will stimulate CERT-3 and SOD activation. So again, it interacts with FOXO3, enhances antioxidant capacity. Now, we're going to briefly talk about the FOX heads. And just as a brief explanation, when you get your reactive oxygen species, DNA damage stimulates these enzymes for the FOXO to, to jump in to give stress resistance, longevity, support autophagy. The FOXOs regulate autophagy, cell proliferation and survival, uh, manganese SOD expression, catalase expression. Now, this one I think is key, glutamine synthesis expression, because I believe that we are having a crisis of too high of a glutamate. You know, glutamate is what makes you intelligent, highly motivated go-getter, but in excess uh, creates all kinds of anxiety and inflammation. So FOXO expression is stimulated by the sirtuins, reactive oxygen species, and calorie restrictions. Just briefly, FOXO1 modulates numerous genes involved in apoptosis, as we mentioned, autophagy, antioxidant enzymes, cell cycle arrest, and metabolic and immune regulators. FOXO3, again, longevity, stimulates autophagy through uh, phosphorylation. And here you go, your EGCG, curcumin, uh, may increase the uh, FOXO3 expression. So what do we do? Resveratrol may activate CERT3 and CERT1. Got to make sure you have enough NAD+. And if somebody has CERT3 problems, you really need to support the urea cycle because their ammonia can get out of control, which as you may know, depletes your BH4. That's also a cofactor for nitric oxide and serotonin. CERT3 supports autophagy, so consider autophagy support with CERT's mutations. Now, very briefly, we're gonna talk about the, the PARPs. Uh, these cleave to NAD to produce uh, what's called the post-translational modifier that attaches to other target proteins that repairs your DNA. Here you can see down here, primary role in DNA damage repair. So if we don't have enough NAD, we're not going to be repairing our, our cells as they're damaged. 
Then if we don't have enough NAD and we don't make enough NADPH, we're not gonna have enough antioxidants. So environmental toxins are going to make more damage to the body and the, uh, the process just feeds upon itself. We could probably do a whole webinar on this chart, but I'm just gonna hit it briefly. So when oxidative stress hits it, uh, the PARP activation goes in, which starts using your uh, NAD plus to repair your, uh, to repair your damaged DNA. But because it's reducing your NAD plus, that's gonna take it away from the certs to be able to, uh, to, be able to uh, recycle your antioxidants and do protection. So here you can see your fasting caloric restriction support the CERT, resveratrol does, and uh, oxidative stress inhibits because the oxidative stress is then being used by the, uh, to activate the PARPs. So interesting dance between these two, but it all comes down to, we have to make sure we have enough uh, NAD+. Now here is, a phrase that I've coined, and this is gonna be our major topic in the next webinar. So make sure you tune into the next one because I'm gonna be talking about the NADPH steel. I'm just gonna introduce you to it today. Now, if you remember in the very beginning, I talked about how the NAD and the NADPH is antioxidant plus oxidative. That's why I'm very intrigued by the NOx enzyme. NADPH oxidase. You'll see there it says its only known role is to produce reactive oxygen species. Now, why would it do that? Well, when we have a virus or a bacteria or a cancer cell, not, uh, uh, reactive oxygen species is our friend. They stimulate uh, the mast cells to do their job and kill the pathogen. Studies have shown without that, we die of infection. However, what I'm, my whole major thrust in my research is that I believe environmental factors made worse in those with epigenetic or genetic weakness is upregulating this NOx enzyme. Now, what does it do? It uses NADPH and oxygen from your iron to produce the reactive oxygen species superoxide, which then stimulates the mast cell. Glial cells express the NOx enzyme. Mast cells may express NOx, and NOx may stimulate mast cells. Purely speculative here. So let me just say there's no papers on this. But I, I have to wonder, you know, when a child gets a strep throat, and then all of a sudden they go into pan pandas, what happened? So I'm throwing out the potential here. Again, just Bob Miller potential. I have to wonder if these things don't begin this process and then it just feeds upon itself. NOx has been shown to have a potentially complex relationship with mTOR. So, and then mTOR, as you'll see, stimulates the NOx enzyme. Now, NOx enzyme is needed. Again, we don't have that, we don't kill pathogens, but in excess, cardiovascular disease, neurodegeneration, organ failure, cancer, and autism. So here's a paper that uh, we refer to, targeting these enzymatic reactive oxygen species with natural compounds without affecting the physiological redox state may be an important tool. Okay. Uh, now, we all know that uh, glutamate is necessary. That makes us highly motivated, go-getters, get-her-done type A kind of people. Probably most of you on this webinar tonight uh, have higher levels of glutamate than the average person, which makes you think out of the box and do the exciting things you're doing. But when it gets too high, it induces excitotoxicity and cell death. So it has a bi-directional relationship with neural and general inflammation. Research suggests that glutamate-induced NOx activation may be a downstream mechanism of excess glutamate. And in my own uh, health consulting, I believe that so many people have excess glutamate. So anxiety, depression, autism, and various neurogenital uh, degenerative conditions. Uh, when Jim Smith did his study at uh, Arizona State University, they found higher glutamate in the children with autism. 
here's the paper, Activation of NOx2 by Stimulation of, uh, of Glutamate Receptors. And so prolonged activation of the glutamate receptors leads to excitotoxicity. It has been suggested that the reactive oxygen species enzyme, NADPH oxidase, plays a role in this excitotoxicity, and that is caused by some of that excess glutamate. Now, here's one of my charts that uh, I refer to quite often. I created this chart, and it shows the, uh, the glutamate, a complex molecule. Uh, glutamate, as you know, if everything's working well, will make glutathione. Genetic variants or difficulties in this pathway can not let that happen. Through the GLUL, it turns into glutamine, which we know is healing, but inflammation or infection can inhibit that. Then the glutamine gets down into glutamate. Genetic variants here can impact that. GAD uh, is your uh, transfer of glutamate to GABA, the relaxing GABA. Inflammation or infection can inhibit that. And then glutamate also in the Krebs cycle turns into alpha ketoglutarate and succinyl COA for the heme cycle, which is another subject on itself. But again, we need NAD plus as the cofactor, controlled by SIRT3. So if something goes wrong here, you're going to be high in glutamate, and these are the people dealing with major amounts of uh, anxiety. This is why I'm a huge fan of herbs like Hinocchio. That's why we created the product Excitoblocks to support the glutamate to GABA conversion. Side note, if the heme cycle is interrupted, the, uh, the porphyrins will block the GABA receptor sites. And that's why sometimes people get what we call hangry. Now, this is the essence of the NADPH steel that we'll be gonna be drilling down on more next uh, webinar. Here's NOx, NADPH oxidase. When we get a virus or a bacteria, it does its job, creates superoxide and hydrogen peroxide, stimulates the mast cells. In an ideal world, we kill the pathogen and then we go back and let NADPH do what it's supposed to be doing. However, as I say down here at the bottom right, when NADPH is used excessively by NOx, recycling of antioxidants, nitric oxide production, and iron to ferritin conversion is inhibited. So if we have upregulated mTOR by environmental factors, we've got some histone, oxalates, excess iron, glutamate, particulates, aldosterone, homocysteine, dopamine, sulfites, even low frequency EMF will stimulate this. And then also allergens, antibiotics, uh, some of your Lyme uh, disease issues, mycotoxins that I'm really putting a lot of emphasis on, and EMF will all stimulate the mast cells. This is why there's a lot of interest in luteolin and PEA, and that's why we formulated a product called MC Stabilizer that has some of these things in to calm down these mast cells. So again, the NADPH steel is when NADPH is used excessively to make NOx enzymes, taking away all those other important processes. Note that nitric oxide and oxytocin inhibit NOx. But interestingly, we said earlier that NADPH is needed to make nitric oxide. Oxidized glutathione reduces your nitric oxide. Hence the 3D chess game played underwater. Now, this is the same chart, but I show you what happens. These mast cells create histamine. If we don't have enough uh, dianamine oxidase, and I don't have it on this chart here, but if we don't have enough HNMT to break this down, or we don't have enough uh, n transferase to break histamine down through acetylation, this histamine stays high. That will create, uh, these mast cells then also create cytokines. And just as a side note, we're doing a lot of research on interleukin-13. We think this is a very significant smoking gun because when it's mutated, and I'm finding that when people have a lot of mutations on IL-13, these are the sickest of the sick, it actually stimulates more mast cells and this thing just feeds upon itself. Now, as you all know, we need cortisol to calm some of this down, made by the adrenal glands, 
And so consequently, this could be a factor in why we're seeing so much adrenal fatigue, because the body's desperately trying to support uh, breaking down this excess histamine. And you'll see that histamine further stimulates the NOx enzyme. Now, let's look at how we make NADPH. As we said earlier, tryptophan comes down through various steps. QPRT can mess it up. Mutations here can be a problem. NQO1 can change the balance between these two. So here's the genes, TDO1, IDO1, IDO2 that all need tryptophan. We have the KYNU, the chironine to quinolinic acid, QPRT, the quinolinic acid to NAMN, NMNAT and NADS, final steps to NAD+, and then NQO1. So in the functional genomic software, when you run that, we look at all of these to decide, is there a problem here? Now, there's pentose phosphate pathway, and this is where your glucose is used, and the G6PD enzyme to make NADPH. Interestingly, I don't think we spend enough time talking about G6PD, because G6PD is one of the most common genetic mutations in the world. And what I'm finding is that when people have uh, difficulty with their G6PD enzymes, they're very depleted in making uh, their NADPH. And uh, this is a huge uh, uh, issue. Uh, and I, what I see many times is that when we've got mutations in G6PD and we're making free radicals, particularly through uh, uh, dysregulation of iron or NOS uncoupling, these are the people that are in trouble because they're not making enough NADPH and then they have a higher demand by the NOx enzyme. So if we go back to the uh, NADPH steel, if indeed your NADPH is being used excessively and then you've got deficiencies in production, those are the people that I consistently see struggling. The ME1 also is part of your NADPH production and IDH. So there's many ways that we make this. And then also, this is in the Krebs cycle, to make your alpha ketoglutarate for energy. So if you have trouble here, not only do you not get NADPH, but your energy production in the mitochondria is compromised. Okay. Now, G6PD supports NADPH production. Benfotamine has been has the potential to support this activity. ME1 and these that we just talked about, NADK and IDH1, this is your NAD plus to NADPH. So you can now get this in the reports, but in the very near future, when the software has the map in there, you're actually gonna be see colors, green, yellow, orange, or red. So you get a big picture of what's, uh, what's happening. So how do we support NAD? Niacin, nicotinamide riboside, and of course, you know, many of you I'm sure are aware of, uh, you know, Sinclair from Harvard talking about the importance of this. Nicotinamide mononucleotide, which I think I'm leaning towards myself, uh, grapeseed extract to support the quinolinic acid to NMN, and uh, Paul Diarco, and that's why I formulated uh, NMN plus that has the nicotinamide mononucleotide, grapeseed extract, and Paul Diarco. So there again, that's just a, another one that we just uh, looked at. So one of my favorite sayings is, when the house is burning down, don't wash the windows and mow the lawn. So that's why I've taken the approach of the pyramid approach to functional genomics. And what I mean by that is, when people are not doing well, one of the first things we have to do is find out, they, are they making excess free radicals? So we look at the Fenton reaction that we'll be talking about in the third webinar. Uh, NOS uncoupling, where we're making superoxide rather than nitric oxide. Not converting glutamate to GABA. Uh, whole subject here. Uh, not breaking down your histamine foods. Uh, making more oxalates. Disruptions in the heme pathway, so you don't make enough heme, which is 
critical for many processes of detoxification. And then some of the enzymes that uh, like the kid enzymes that will actually make the mast cells be overactive. So we have to look at first. Then let's look at our antioxidants. NERF2 and KEEP1 that control the making of all the antioxidants. What we just spoke about tonight, how you're making glutathione, how you make SOD and catalase, how you're doing on the sirtuins, how you're doing on the foxos. When I do a consult with individuals who are really struggling, this is where we start. Are one of these cranking out more free radicals? And simultaneously, are we having difficulty with your production of any of your antioxidants? Just observationally, when people can't seem to get on top of Lyme disease or other issues, mold sensitivity, multiple chemical sensitivity. Usually something is creating excess free radicals and something is impeding their antioxidants. And each person is individualized. Then we look at uh, phase three, autophagy, urea cycle. And this is an area that we're really starting to specialize in. Are you having weakness in your sulfation, glucuronidation, acetylation, glutathione conjugation, or methylation from a detox standpoint. Because you know you, you need your SAMI through making it, but also you need your SAMI for uh, some of your detox processes. Then we look at fats and carbs, neurotransmitter, mitochondria, uh, and then we move up with uh, PON1, CYPs, potentially upregulated mTOR, B12, and, no and note folate last. Isn't that interesting that I look at the, uh, the folate last? Uh, because if we push this too far or too fast, we can actually have uh, some difficulties. So that's the whole premise of how I use my, uh, my software. Now, how do you uh, get to use all this? Uh, I founded the uh, Nutrigenic Research Institute, and I have a whole host of health professionals on there with me to do some of the research. Functional genomic analysis is the cloud-based software that organizes, interpret the SNPs. Your genomic resource is the genetic test that we made. And then uh, I've worked with professional health products on supplements and started my own line called Functional Genomic Analysis, which you can now also in the software is gonna be very exciting. We're giving you the ability as the doctor to make your own supplement. So I think what I'll do is I'll just very briefly, you know, bring this, uh, bring this over. This is a live uh, pyramid, and you'll see that when I click on here, and firstly, if I just want to look at the, uh, the amount of genes, this is related to Fenton reaction. It shows you a rating of plus three to minus three on each of the enzymes. Then you can click on here and actually look at, you know, here's the beast, the, uh, copper transporters, here's the, uh, here's the SOD, and here it says variant. So when it's blank, that means mom and dad gave you a good gene. When there's a one, one heterozygous, two homozygous. Uh, then we look at uh, copper, which is needed for iron. Uh, then if we think there might be supplements needed, there are suggestions of what you can do. Here's your ceruloplasm, and then we create a a bell curve, and you can actually see out of 40,000 people where this person is versus the, uh, I'm sorry, where this person is compared to the, uh, to the average. And the bell curve, of course, changes in each one. Here you can see on ceruloplasm, uh, we have 0.15% uh, of the people in here have 30% variated. Nobody exists beyond that. So you can see that ceruloplasm variants uh, are very important. So here's the nutrigenicresearch.org. This is where we do our, uh, our research. You can go here for information on our conferences, conference coming up in September on mitotoxins. We have an online certification course that's gonna be up, uh, updated very soon, but the first three modules are free. And if you go to uh, yourgenomicresource.com, that's kind of like where the public can go, talks about the chip we're making and then here's what the, uh, the kit looks like. We partners with uh, Thermo Fisher, 
and Rutgers is our lab and fulfillment center and includes 200,000 SNPs. And it's only $199 to ship the test to them, ship it back, take out the DNA, ship it to the software and have a report generated. Uh, we cut every corner we could to make this incredibly inexpensive for you. And then the software that does the work, functionalgenomicanalysis.com or DNA supplementation. Dot com. So if you go there, uh, the website looks like this. You can click right on the certification course. The first three modules are free. Our webinar act, act, uh, archive, upcoming seminar information. And if you want to register account, again, if you're a health professional, you have to tell us you have a business or give us your license. You can request an account. You can do so for free, upload one. If you have an old 23andMe, upload it, uh, play around with it. So Mike, uh, we managed to get through there in uh, 53 minutes, a fair amount of, uh, of information. So I think now we're ready to uh, answer uh, any questions that anyone might have. Yeah, that was quite a bit of information, Dr. Molly. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. I'm really looking forward to uh, diving into the other two webinars that you're offering. So thank you very much for doing those. Uh, Lynn is going to host those webinars just for you uh, who are interested and still online here. Um, number two is going to be on how the overexpression of the NOx enzyme is creating the NADPH steel, as Dr. Miller uh, was alluding to earlier. And then the third one is going to be talking about the dysregulation of iron and how it's contributing to inflammation and poor detoxification of environmental toxins. So, um, yeah, stay tuned. There's a lot more to go. But from uh, goodness, you, you covered so much ground, uh, Bob. I, yes, I, you yeah. know, and and to see your 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 analysis in clinical practice is is fascinating. To see your priority tree and the pyramid and how everything's working out and how you can click on each individual. Uh, gene is is uh, is fascinating, and then in categories of genes as well. Um, I, I really appreciate all the work that you have put in there, and your team as well. It's it's amazing. Um, we do have one question from Anne here, and she says, "How do we support the conversion from heme to ferritin?" Oh well, let me uh, let me see if I can pull up a chart here for that. Uh, let me see if I can do that. Yeah, great. I'll uh, I'll try to pull up this uh, this chart. And I'll move this over here. So the um, here is the, that's a very good question. So this is the the chart that I use, and this is what's going to be in the uh, in the software. So I talked a little bit about the uh, you know in the mitochondria, your your fats, carbohydrates, and proteins come down in to make your ATP. But succinyl CoA is right here, and then. Glycine, and of course, Stephanie Seneff believes that uh, glyphosate is impacting this. So, succinyl COA and glycine go through multiple steps. And if we have any genetic mutations in any of these guys along here, uh, we can affect the impact, the production of the heme. Interestingly, lead, and I know uh, Dr. Patrick is a big fan of the, uh, you know, how the, uh, the heavy metals can hurt us and you know, lead will impact a lead and fetch, so we don't make this. But anyway, the question was about the heme. But let me just first show about why heme is so important. But, you know, heme, not only is hemoglobin, but cytochrome P450, phase one, peroxidase, catalase, NADPH, and SUOX. So the HMOX enzyme is what takes that heme over to uh, ferritin, your biliverdin to bilirubin and your carbon dioxide to stimulate your KEEP1 and NERF2. Cytochrome P450 reductase is needed, plus NADPH. So in the, uh, probably in the next couple of weeks, uh, we're gonna have a, a supplement called HMOX Assist that supports this HMOX enzyme to make that conversion. And I believe that the, uh, the HMOX enzyme is incredibly important. Uh, because not only does it do this, but look over here, it inhibits the mast cells. So if this HMOX gene isn't working, mast cells can be run away. And when we have mutations in KIT, that can uh, cause this to be overactive. So specifically, uh, hops 
is one of the, uh, the nutrients that helps this. But we have found that many times it's an NADPH deficiency. Bring the NADPH up, HMOX will start working more effectively. And I'm a big fan of looking at the, uh, the HMOX enzymes. Uh, and I see when people have a lot of homozygous variants in their HMOX, uh, they're many times uh, struggling uh, dramatically. And that's why we're coming up with a product called HMOX Assist. But we have to make sure there's enough NADPH. So to make sure there's enough NADPH, what we talk about next week is making sure that NOx isn't upregulated and then making sure that we're making enough NADPH. So uh, stay tuned. We'll have more information on uh, a product called HMOX Assist. But again, uh, NADPH is uh, critical. Wonderful. Gosh, that's a fascinating explanation. Um, NQ01 and tremors. You had mentioned during the webinar that you might be able to get to a case of a person. Um... Sure. Yeah. Let me again do a screen share here with the. Uh, Great. Thank you. With the uh, with the uh, NQ01, I had a about a 73 year old gentleman come to me with tremors because uh, medically they were running out of ideas what to do. The only idea they had left over was to put a. Uh, a metal wire in his brain, which he really wasn't too excited about. No. So he had a homozygous variant on the NQ01. So we just gave him a teaspoon of a tincture of Podiarco, and the tremors decreased by about 90%. Oh my goodness. And he was thrilled. I mean, he's like one of our biggest fans now. So what really makes this a fascinating story, though, is I said, well, let's do this. Let's give you a little nicotamide mononucleotide. And he started taking that. And he called me and said, Bob, the tremors are coming back. Fascinating. So we reduced the NMN, increased the Podiarco, and the tremors went back down to where they were before. So to me, that was uh, pretty fascinating that this NADH to NAD plus ratio was off. Mm. And uh, so that to me is uh, quite, uh, quite fascinating. And uh, that's why I formulated a product called NMN plus that has the nicotabide mononucleotide, grapeseed extract, and Podiarco. Mm. And just to give a teaser of what we're going to talk about next week, you know, a lot of people are learning about NAD and it's becoming very popular. And, you know, some doctors are doing NAD infusions Sometimes it works beautifully, and sometimes it doesn't. Because if the NADPH is being used by the NOx enzyme to make superoxide and mast cells, boosting this can actually be contraindicated. So that's why I believe we've got to calm this guy down first before we start pushing the NADPH. Great. Okay, Bob, real quick question. Kat wants to know, um, she can have access to the recording. Yes, Kat. Um, how about slides? She thinks this is an excellent and complicated talk. She really wants to dive into it and she wants to review um, either the transcript or the slides. So oh, absolutely. I, I'll send them, tell me who to send them to and they're, they're, uh, you can have great. them. No, okay, there's we'll, no, post, no we'll post them on EHS, that's great. Yeah, keep posted there, Kat. All right, well, um, one quick uh, question I have is, um, you know, when we're talking about genetics and you're looking at genetics and you're saying, okay, there's a propensity, there's a likelihood that this person is going to have a challenge if they're, you know, homozygotic, for example. But um, what if that person is eating all the right foods, doing all the lifestyle stuff and has, you know, fantastic uh, nutrient cofactor uh, function, uh, but not enzyme function that needs the cofactors? Um, you know, are, do you take into consideration diet lifestyle stuff and, and have you then fed into your analysis then lab results, for example? So you mentioned sure. the GPL oats or the Genova oats or Nutraval or anything like that. Um, do, you, do you look at those cross analysis of what's- oh, Of course, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now, let's talk about that. Uh, Great. So let's look, at, uh, let's look at histamine, okay? Great. So um, there's so much that affects histamine. So say, for example, someone has genetic mutations on HNMT that maybe at best this works at 80%. Uh -huh. Now, 
some people have difficulty with histamine foods, you know, the fermented foods. So if they would have a deficiency in the dynamine oxidase and some well-meaning person says, oh, you're going to get better by drinking kombucha and eating miso and sauerkraut and do all these things, they're going to jack up their histamine load and they're going to do worse. Right. Now, if you're doing all the right things, that 80% might be more than enough. You might never know you have a problem if you're at 80%. Now, because of those mutations, you're probably at 80% of maximum, but for a lot of people that might be good enough. But if you're exposed to, uh, to Borrelia, or you start getting some mycotoxins, or you're exposed to a lot of EMF, <clears throat> and the mast cells are upregulated, and you get more histamine, that 80% may not be good enough anymore. Mm -hmm. okay. Then also, as we talked about earlier, we need SAMI, s methionine. If HNMT is perfect and we don't have enough SAMI, it's not going to work. It's like having a sure. brand new car right. without gasoline. Right. Now, if we go over to, um, to methylation, which everyone, you know, everyone knows about methylation. Yeah. If you have hydroxyl radicals because of iron, that will inhibit the MAT gene that turns your methionine to SAMI. Mm -hmm. So here, once again, dysregulation of your iron cuts down your SAMI, and again, you could have 100% function of your HNMT, but if you don't have SAMI, it's not going to, to work. So it's the enzyme function. So if you're eating healthy and you are not uh, creating a lot of histamine, 80%, good enough. Right. But if this goes down to 20%, well, then no matter what you do, it may not be enough. I mean, I talk to people all the time who do everything right and they still have a histamine problem because they have like a homozygous on 80% of these. Yeah. But if you just have a couple of heterozygous and everybody's got genetic mutations. So that's why I call it the 3D chess game played underwater. <laughs> and then if your adrenals are fatigued due to stress, you know, you have a stressful lifestyle and you don't have enough cortisol and then the histamine is going to go higher, putting more of a burden on these guys as well. So that's why it's going to be exciting when I, when I get this finished. Rather than just coming up as a purple enzyme, each of these will come up with green, yellow, orange, or red based upon the amount of SNPs. We might even eventually get to the point that we might even put epigenetic factors. That's down the road, but epigenetic factors that could be impacting. Because you need to look at this big picture. The days are just saying, oh my gosh, I have COMT or I have MTHFR. Uh, that's really not all that important anymore. We have to look at a much bigger picture of what's, uh, what's going on. I really appreciate you saying that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, one quick question too. Can you quickly mention what the difference is between a deletion versus a SNP? Oh, sure. Well, deletion is when it's just not there. So okay. therefore it's, uh, you know, a SNP might be, uh, you know, uh, when it's, you know, you have the A, C, T, and G, and there's one that's most effective and one that's not. So when you've got that mutation, it might be uh, reduced. When it's not there, it's just not there. Yeah, like a GSTM null, right. for example. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, someone asked that question earlier. Good. Great, fantastic. I, uh, I can't thank you enough. Uh, as always, this is fascinating information. And I, I just want to dive in, you know, for, for hours at a time. And I'm looking forward to the next two webinars. So please, folks, everyone join us uh, for webinar number two, number, number three. They won't be live. They'll be recorded. You have access to them. You can watch them at, at whatever speed you like. So I know I'll be putting my half speed, Dr. Miller, to <laughs> make sure I absorb everything. But uh, yeah. yes, and then please join us at the Environmental Health Symposium coming up in early April. We're going to be in Scottsdale, Arizona, beautiful Scottsdale. It's always lovely every time we have the conference. And uh, Bob's going to be there answering all your questions. He can show you some sample tests, and you can come by the booth and, and chat with him for uh, as long as you'd like. So uh, Bob, we can't thank you enough for everything you're doing. It's really changing people's lives and really expanding our knowledge base as clinicians as to what we can put in our toolbox. So I can't thank you enough. And I My pleasure. You... Final, if I can make a final point. Oh, please. So the other thing that we're doing is, you know, many times, many supplement companies make excellent supplements. Yes. But you go to show it to someone and they say, oh, I can't take fill in the blank. Because so, of your genes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I'm working with personalized nutrients that in the software, people can actually take one of the formulas, remove ingredients, 
reduce some in that nutrients, increase others, blend them together to take us truly to the personalized level. We, you know, we can answer questions on that at, uh, at the uh, EHS conference, but I believe that is the next evolution that we have to be able to make a custom supplement for that person. So for example, you know, if somebody has a histamine issue, there's lots of things that'll reduce histamine and quercetin's a good one, but if they have a lot of COMT, the quercetin may work against them. Yeah. So we want to be able to tell them, consider maybe customizing this with little to no quercetin. And that's going to make sure, because the old Hippocratic Oath is first do no harm. Yeah. And I know everybody listening to this doesn't want to do any harm, but if they're honest, they've given people things that have backfired. Yeah. And uh, we want to try to reduce that as much as we can. Bio-individual supplementation based on nutrigenomics. Wow. Yes. Fantastic. It's the next level, isn't it? I think it is. <laughs> all right, Bob. Well, gosh, I can't thank you enough. And uh, we all uh, look forward to seeing you in Scottsdale real soon. Looking forward to it myself. All right. Take care. Have a pleasant evening. You as well. Thank you.